How did I get here? I was happily using one of the cheapest mechanical keyboards you can buy, the Red Dragon K552. When I ordered it from Amazon, it asks you to select the color of switches you want. At the time, I had no idea what the color of the switch meant, so I just picked a color that sounded nice, which was blue. It sounded nice when I was ordering them, not quite as nice when I was typing on them. If you're like I was and don't know what blue switches are, they're typically what's called clicky switches, which are basically about as loud and obnoxious as you can get. At the time, I thought they were just okay, so I went with it. In the keyboard community, it's pretty well accepted that you shouldn't use clicky switches in an office environment where you're working near other people, but I was blissfully ignorant at the time, so I actually used it in the office. I'm pretty sure a coworker offered to buy me a new keyboard, but for whatever reason, I guess I just couldn't take a hint. Fortunately for them, in March of 2020, everyone began working from home, so they no longer had to suffer from my keyboard cacophony. Anyway, for the price, the Red Dragon is actually a pretty decent board, but if I did it again, I probably would have gotten the red switches, which are much quieter than the blue ones. Then I saw this video about split keyboards, and that's when my world got flipped upside down, and my bank account split in half. More on that at the end of the video. <laughs> but it turns out that splitting the keyboard in half is only a small part of the story. Depending on how you use your computer, there's actually potentially quite a few issues with quote unquote normal keyboards. And everyone seems to have the same response to this. Well, it's been working for me. And it's not that they're wrong, but let's put it this way. Horses and carriages were working fine for transportation, but that didn't stop us from making airplanes and cars, right? In this video, I'm gonna go over some next-gen keyboards that I've really grown to enjoy, and the cool thing about everything I'm gonna talk about is that none of it is an all or nothing commitment. You can kind of just cherry pick the stuff you like and discard the stuff that you don't like. I actually spent a pretty substantial amount of money on all the keyboards I'm going to talk about in this video. It's a little bit hard to think about and I'll go over the exact number and break down at the end. First, let's talk about the transgressions of quote unquote normal keyboards. Let's start with the backspace key. You might take your entire right hand off the home row and tap it with your stronger fingers, or you might hit it with your pinky, but unless you have gargantuan hands, Either way, some of your fingers are going to come off the home row when you press backspace. And if you make as many typos as I do, that's bound to slow you down. Next up is the space bar. Why do we need two thumbs for one key? Okay, you might use your thumbs to also tap the keys immediately to the right and left of the space bar, but still, that's basically two keys for two thumbs. If you think of the range of motion of both thumbs, each one should be able to reach at least four keys each. So with a traditional board, you're basically forfeiting six fast access keys that have this massive obnoxious space bar. And then there's the escape key. It's way the heck out over there, and you basically have to do some hand acrobatics to press it while keeping a finger or two on the home row. Then there's the row stagger that these boards inherited from the beloved typewriter. This isn't really a problem in and of itself, other than having to make some awkward reaches like from the F key to the B key. The real downer about row staggered keys is that they prevent you from having a column stagger, which makes a lot more sense given the shapes of our fingers. So because the home row runs in a straight line perpendicular to our fingers, we have to curl up our longest fingers so that the shortest fingers can reach the keys. Then there's something called ulnar deviation, basically a fancy term for keeping your wrist bent in an unnatural direction, which traditional keyboards force you to do. Next up is the arrow keys. They are so far from the home row that you need to lift your entire right hand off the home row to use them. And then the number keys. They're pretty inconvenient to reach for how often most people use them. The number pad on full size boards makes it a little better, but for that you need to completely take your right hand off the home row. You might be starting to see a pattern here. We have lots of keys, some of which are frequently used, that require us to lift our hands off the home row to reach them. Okay, so first, at the same time I was getting interested in possible solutions to these sorts of problems, I was also looking into what else was out there in the world of traditional keyboards. And I wound up ordering a Keychron Q1, which is actually a fantastic board. If you decide you don't like any of the next gen stuff in the rest of the video, and you want to upgrade your traditional board, this might be a good one to get. I remember when I pulled it out of the box and pressed a few keys, it was like a religious experience. And I immediately regretted spending so much of my software development career using the cheapest keyboards I could find. It has Gateron Pro Red linear switches, which feel amazing and are actually what I wound up choosing for another board that I'll get to in a bit. But then literally the day after I received the Q1, I received a board called the Kibio Iris, which wound up being my first foray into the world of next-gen keyboards. At the time, I actually kind of regretted ordering the Iris because I liked the Q1 so much. Anyway, yeah, so the Kibio Iris. Some folks call it ortholinear, which technically means a keyboard where the keys are arranged in a grid, but technically the Iris is called a column stagger keyboard because the columns are staggered to accommodate your different finger lengths. I got it with what's called Duroc Shrimp Silent Tactile Switches, and I was originally hesitant to get silent switches because I generally like the sound of keyboards, but I actually wound up really liking them. They feel and sound really satisfying despite being much quieter than a lot of switches. It only took a day to mostly get used to, but I definitely continued making typos well after that. The default key layout on the iris has what are called layers, where basically you hold down a special layer key, and the function of some or all the keys on the board changes. One thing I liked about the default layout is that in one of the layers, the number keys are actually on the home row. So you can type numbers really fast without your fingers leaving the home row, 
as opposed to having to reach awkwardly two rows above. I didn't actually wind up sticking with the default layout and the iris uses firmware called QMK, which allows you to completely customize your layout. I went through a few iterations of my layout and started to converge on something that I was happy with. For example, for a while I used the top left key for the tilde and the back quote, and I used the rightmost key as backspace, but they both required finger stretches that were a little bit awkward. So I started to wonder if I could avoid using the entire top row. First, it would negate the need to move any finger more than one key away, which is kind of the main benefit, but it also has a side benefit of opening the door to getting another board with even fewer keys, like a keyboard called the Korn. And so that's what I wound up getting once I got comfortable with my new layout that completely eliminated the top row of keys. So basically the layout only has three rows of keys. The Korn also only has three keys per thumb as opposed to the four that the Iris has. So I did have to adjust my layout a bit to get it to accommodate one fewer button for each thumb. But I was never a huge fan of the upper thumb keys in the Iris anyway. I kind of needed to angle my thumb around the bottom thumb keys to reach them, so I was fine with it. I put some Gateron Pro Red switches in the Corn because I really liked how they felt in the Keychron Q1. I was pretty happy with the Corn, but it made me curious about using a board with even fewer keys, so that's when I decided to get a Chocofy. The Chocofy is actually a 36 key board, so if you took the Corn and chopped off the leftmost column and the rightmost column, you'd get the Chocofy. That means you never have to move your pinkies laterally, which is nice because it's the weakest finger. And then there's the other main difference about the Chocofy. Every keyboard I've talked about so far has standard size keys that you find on pretty much all mainstream keyboards. The Chocofy has what's called Chocofy switches, which are much lower profile than the standard MX compatible switches. It's slightly awkward, but the keyboard is actually so compact that I can fit both halves in my pockets if I want to. And of course I can pair it with my phone and actually have a nice portable development environment that fits in my pockets. But it is fewer keys, which meant I had to get a little creative with my layout. But using fewer keys is actually a great forcing function because you wind up moving your fingers quite a bit less, even if you're using a board that happens to have more keys. And that's what brings me to what's called home row mods. It's pretty tough to have a 36 key layout without using home row mods. And the premise of home row mods is that instead of having dedicated keys for shift, alt, control, and the operating system key, you actually put them on the home row keys. And the way this works is that if you tap a home row key, it registers as a letter that the home row key is associated with. If you're using a QWERTY layout, that'd be ASDF, JKL, semicolon. But if you hold down one of those keys and press another key, for example, I have my shift keys on the inner home row keys, F and J, so if I hold down the F key and press H, for example, I get a capital H. They take a little bit of time to get used to, but after using them for a while, I actually prefer them even on larger keyboards. For one, it lets you use your strongest fingers for the most frequently used mod keys, and number two, on larger boards, it opens up the possibility of using those mod keys for other things. At the moment, I like to use them for things like plus, minus, underscore, and the pipe operator. Being able to tap the underscore without holding modifiers feels pretty luxurious, especially when you're working in a language like Python or Rust. So yeah, that's home row mods. Okay, back to the Chocofy. I loved it, especially for its portability. And while I did come up with a 36 key layout that I was pretty happy with, there were some keys that I would have preferred to have on the default layer, even if it did require moving my pinky fingers laterally. That led me to the Pintor, which has 42 keys, so now we're adding back those left and rightmost columns. It actually has the same number of keys as the Corn, and the layout is pretty similar to the Corn, but it has a much more aggressive column sagger, kind of like the Chocofy. Also like the Chocofy, it has chalk keys instead of the standard size ones on the Corn. I pretty much kept the layout the same as the 36 key layout that I used in the Chocofy, but then I took six of my most used keys from my number and symbol layer and put them on the base layer of the Pintor using those six extra keys. So instead of having to press a layer key to get the equal sign underscore escape plus minus in the pipe character, I just had to move my pinkies laterally slightly, which I found preferable given how often I use those keys. And from that point, I decided I'd always use a layout that is usable on a 36 key board, but adds more commonly used keys to the base layer on boards with more than 36 keys. So basically it has the flexibility to work on a 36 key board, but takes advantage of the extra keys on larger boards. Speaking of larger boards, one might think that I'd tried enough keyboards at this point, but I felt like there's a bit more ground to cover for the sake of completeness. Or at least that's how I rationalized it anyway. And there's a certain streamer I admire that swears by Kinesis keyboards, so I had to give one a try. You gotta warn people! It's so bright! Here's another language. I don't know it. Well, I don't even know this one. Who is this person that makes this? Code to the moon. Go subscribe to Code to the Moon. The Kinesis Advantage 360. It has a column stagger like all the previous boards, but it also has a curved key well, which serves a few purposes. It reduces the angle your wrists need to be at to type, and it also reduces the distance your fingers need to travel to move to different keys. It's a little hard to see, but in addition to that, there's actually vertical steps between the columns of keys, so the keys you touch with your middle fingers are actually set deeper than the rest of the keys. I found that that made it really comfortable. The Advantage 360 comes in both wired and wireless variants. I got the wireless variant mainly because it uses ZMK, which is actually the same firmware used by the Chocofy, so I figured it'd make it easier to copy over my key layout, and it was. The board has quite a few more keys than any of the other boards I've talked about so far. Like the Iris, I actually personally don't use the top row of keys at all, but if you do decide to use them, the key well curvature does make them quite a bit easier to press. I am trying to make use of the extra keys on the thumb clusters, 
The Kinesis has six keys per thumb cluster instead of the three that I'm used to. Overall, I found the Kinesis to be really nice, and I think the key wells make it feel really comfortable. Obviously, it's not as compact as something like the Chocofy, but its heftier size actually makes it more ideal for using it to type on weird surfaces like carpet or even the couch. The board has Gateron Brown tactile switches, which are a bit louder than most of the other boards I've been talking about, but they sound and feel pretty good. No complaints at all from me there. Overall, I was really happy with the Kinesis, but it turns out my keyboard tour didn't end there either. Enter the Glove 80. The Glove 80 has a lot in common with the Kinesis. It has curved key wells, a column stagger, six keys per thumb cluster, it supports Bluetooth, it uses ZMK, and so on. But instead of standard size keys, it has chalk keys, which is pretty interesting. It also has an entire extra row of keys above what would be the topmost row on the Kinesis. So you can actually have function keys on the base layer, which might be nice for some people. The thumb clusters each have two rows of keys with the back row slightly elevated above the bottom row, so it's easier to avoid accidentally hitting keys in the bottom row when you're going for one in the top row. Oh, and it has some nice RGB too. Overall, the Glove 80 feels really, really comfortable. It comes with red linear 50 gram switches, which I think sound and feel amazing. The stock keycaps feel smooth to the touch, but not slippery. And yeah, overall, just a really great board. I feel like it takes many of the features I like most about some of the other boards I tried and puts them all into one board. The only thing I would change about it if I could, and it's not really a big deal at all, is I would remove the top two rows of keys. I simply don't use them, even though the curvature makes them pretty easy to reach if you do want to use them. Okay, so as of the time I'm making this video, my keyboard tour ended there. I'm really happy I tried all these boards and I'm pretty sure I'm actually gonna keep all of them. It's actually really hard to choose one board I like the most and I actually plan to rotate between several of them depending on what I feel like. But if I had to pick one board, it would be the Glove 80. I think this is going to be my go-to for the foreseeable future. This is a little bit of a cop-out, but I also think the Piantor is really comfortable with pretty much the perfect number of keys, at least for my taste. So I'll definitely be using that too. And I also think I'll be making a lot of use of the Kinesis Advantage 360, especially for times when I need to type on something other than a desk, like on the floor in my kid's playroom, for example. I actually tried typing with it laying down in bed, and it even seems to work for that as well. Okay, so how much did I spend on all the keyboards I showed in this video? Okay, this hurts a little bit, but here we go. The Keychron Q1 was $225.19 cents after tax from amazon.com. The Kibio Iris was $252.65 after tax and shipping. The Corn Rev 3 was $290.31 after tax. I did order the pre-soldered version though, so if you're willing to spend the time to build the board yourself, you'll save about 80 bucks. The Chocofy was $316 with the case and controller choices that I made. Again, you can save money if you choose different options and if you're willing to do all the soldering yourself. I also had to buy the batteries for it separately on Amazon, so that was another $19.38. The Piantor was $228 even. Again, same thing there. If you're willing to do all the soldering yourself, you can save about $80 off that price. The Kinesis Advantage 360 was $494.57 after tax. Of the boards I've talked about, it wins the award for most expensive, but it is a really solid board. Finally, the Glove 80 was $399 with free shipping. So yeah, the total comes out to $2,205.72. That's a little hard for me to think about, but I personally don't regret it. That said, I don't think there's a good reason for most people to spend that much money on keyboards, and hopefully this video will save you some money by helping you hone in on the specific one or two boards that might be a good fit for you. Or maybe it's shown you that this next-gen keyboard thing is not for you, and you want none of it. In that case, it saved you even more money, and that's fantastic. If you do like next-gen things that haven't necessarily received mainstream attention yet, you'll definitely want to check out this video I made on the Lobster Pro programming language. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll have links to all the keyboards I talked about in the description. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.